The following podcast contains discussions of violence, injustice, narcissism, and the violence that happens because of said narcissism. Also, spoilers. Lots of spoilers. Ready? Let's dig in. It was fate that brought them together in Italy. A doctor, two poets, and two young mistresses. Fate that caused a volcano to erupt. A year ago and 7,000 miles away in Indonesia. An interruption that would continue to wreak havoc on the weather all around the world. And it was fate that had them trapped inside a villa that rainy day in summer. We will each write a ghost story. The poet proposed to cure their boredom. And so Mary did. Hey, girlfriends! Here's a tip from original goth girl and general kick-ass lady Mary Shelley. Don't just vague book when your guy's being an a-hole. Write a whole frickin' book to expose just how much of a useless jerkwad he is and give birth to a whole new genre of literature. Goals, right? Anyway, what is up, you guys? I'm Gabby, and this is Digestibles, a podcast about all the books you were told to read but probably didn't. And for this episode, we are going to talk about Frankenstein, most often considered as the first science fiction novel ever written. And it all started with an epic ghost writing contest. Surprisingly enough, only two of the works would eventually survive, and not by any of the professional writers in the room. One was the first vampire short story in English lit, the other was Frankenstein. Mary Shelley, or Godwin since she was still unmarried at the time, was only 18 when she began writing her most famous novel. It would be published two years later in 1818, anonymously, of course, because who would take a young woman writer seriously? Reviews were mixed anyway, but it became very popular, getting adapted into theater a lot so that most of our ideas of the creature, the green skin, square head, awkward speech and movements, comes from those plays. The definitive edition, the one that everyone reads now, was released in 1831. Mary, now 30-something and no longer anonymous, would revise and edit and add an introduction to the book to explain how she came to write the story in the first place. Probably because her husband, a well-known poet, had written the original preface and everyone just assumed it was his work. Actually, people still try to say that he wrote some of it, but most scholars agree that his contribution was more like an editor rather than a co-writer. I'll try to mention some of the differences as we go along, but I'll use the 1831 edition because because that's the version you'll most likely be reading or rereading someday. The novel begins with a framing device. Four letters written by a Captain Robert Walton to his sister. He's 28 years old and on a mission. A voyage of discovery, you might say. To boldly go where no man has ever gone before. For the 19th century, that meant the North Pole. And a spoiler alert, he doesn't actually get there. In real life, no man would stand on the North Pole until 1948. Since the book is written in shifting first-person points of view, we get a pretty good look at everyone's character. Captain Walton is ambitious, thirsty for glory, and is kind of arrogant. He thinks he's better than everyone else on the ship and no one there can truly get him. Which is why he has no friends. But hey, at least he loves his sister. So everything is going fine and dandy until one day they get trapped on the ice and fog and they're hoping for better weather to proceed with the journey. While waiting though, they spot a figure in the distance, shaped like a man but giant-sized traveling through the ice on a sled drawn by dogs. And everyone's like, cool. What? But cool. The next day, they're not stuck anymore, but they see another man. This time, he's practically frozen and drifting on a sheet of broken ice, with all but one of his dogs dead. They're surprised that he's European and speaks English. Even more strange, the man wants to make sure that the ship is going north before he allows himself to be rescued. The crew nurses him back to slightly better health and they find out that the man is chasing the other guy on the sled. Walton and the strange man bond over stuff and they realize they're kindred spirits or something like that. 
They're chummy enough that the stranger begins to tell Walton his story. And so we switch over to Victor Frankenstein's point of view. Victor was born to a rich and important family in Geneva, Switzerland. His father Alphonse married his best friend's daughter Caroline and are pretty happy despite the big age difference. When Victor is five years old, his mother decides to adopt a girl named Elizabeth Lavenza. And this is one of the big differences between the published editions. In the 1818 version, Elizabeth is a cousin that his parents adopt when he's four years old. But since we're going with the 1831 version, Elizabeth is a poor beggar child that they come across while traveling in Italy. She's just so blonde and pretty, compared to the other darker children, that Victor's mother can't help but adopt her so that she and Victor can marry someday. She introduces Elizabeth to Victor like she's a present and Victor's like, sure, okay, she's mine now. So, first cousin or adopted sister, you can decide which is less... Blech. Anyway, his childhood is pretty much perfect. He and Elizabeth are very close, and he has another BFF named Henry Clerval, who is pretty much a golden Labrador retriever in human form, at least in the 1818 version. As Victor grows up, he becomes really interested in science, like he's super obsessed. He especially loves the ancient study of alchemy, which makes him both a hipster and a nerd. Alchemy is so old-fashioned that actual scientists look down on it. This, of course, doesn't stop Victor from self-studying and teaching himself through books. When he's about 15 years old, there's a terrible thunderstorm and Victor witnesses a tree getting utterly destroyed by lightning. A visiting natural philosopher explains all about the science of electricity or galvanism. Another note, in the 1818 version, the one who explains stuff about the destructive nature of science is Victor's father, but this is corrected in the 1831 version because Victor's father is supposedly uninterested in science. Anyway, time passes and at 17, Victor is about to leave for university in Germany when his sister and mother fall ill with scarlet fever. Elizabeth recovers, but his mother dies and makes him promise to marry Elizabeth on her deathbed. A few weeks later, Victor heads to university and meets a couple of professors. The first tells him that all his study of alchemy was a waste of time. The second is a chemistry professor named Waldman. He's nicer than the other and tells Victor that even though alchemy is somewhat misguided, it did provide the foundation for real, actual science. So Victor feels encouraged to study real, actual science now, aka chemistry. So Victor throws himself into his studies, and soon he's mastered everything his professors can throw at him and gets bored with his classes. Worse, he becomes fascinated by the idea of life and where it comes from. He begins to study anatomy and, well, for that time period, the study of anatomy involved hanging out in graveyards and uh, digging up bodies. So far, so weird. But we all know it gets weirder. Suddenly, because he's just totally awesome or totally obsessed, Victor discovers how to make things alive. Victor tells Walton that he won't explain the specifics because of reasons that will be clear by the end of the story. Drunk with his newfound power, Victor decides to make a man. A giant man at that, about 8 feet in height. He begins to imagine this new species as happy and excellent and grateful and maybe God should have had a word with Victor, like, Psst, it doesn't work that way. Haven't you read Jurassic Park? Or the Bible? Anyway, Victor locks himself up in his laboratory to cut up body parts and uh, yeesh, his neighbors must have hated the smell coming from his house. He avoids his family, refuses to have a social life, and ignores the world around him. He grows pale and thin. A year turns to two, summer turns to fall, and soon Victor's creature is ready to be steeped with life. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me, that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. 
It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? Or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful! Great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was a lustrous black and flowing. His teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set. His shriveled complexion and straight black lips. Faced with his creation, Victor thinks, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done this after all. He panics, runs away, and immediately goes to sleep. I, too, would like to sleep away all my mistakes, but at least my mistakes aren't literally made of epic proportions. Anyway, Victor has a nightmare about Elizabeth ending up like his dead mother. He wakes up and spends the night on the lookout for the monster he made. The next day, he bumps into his BFF Henry, who's in town to begin university. They talk for a bit, but when they return to Victor's rooms, he gets a panic attack about the monster again. Then he gets a fever for a couple of months, and Henry takes care of him because he's such a great friend. When Victor is okay enough, Henry hands him a letter from Elizabeth. She's worried about him and wants him to write more. She also tells him about Justine, a servant who's come to live with him after her mother's death. Victor recovers fully, but he's got some kind of PTSD every time he sees anything related to science and chemistry. He avoids his professors and classes. He writes to his father that he wants to return home. While waiting for a reply, he joins Henry for a walking tour around the countryside, and the beauty of nature helps him forget all about the ugly thing he made. Victor's dad writes back, and it's not the good news he's been waiting for. Someone has just murdered his little brother William. They had been walking when William disappeared. They searched for him all night to no avail. He was finally found at around 5 in the morning, seemingly strangled to death. Victor goes home immediately, but it's late at night when he gets there and the gates are closed. He decides to go to the spot where his brother was murdered. A storm is approaching and it's a long, dark walk through the woods. When he finally reaches the spot, a flash of lightning reveals a figure in the trees. It's that awful thing he made. Victor realizes in an instant that the creature is the murderer. Also, apparently almost two years has passed since his making, so Victor wonders if this is the monster's first crime. Of course, instead of doing anything productive about it, he goes off to sulk like, Oh my gosh, I've created a monster. Poor me. Poor you. What about your poor little brother who did? Gosh. Ugh. Anyway, the next day, Victor finds out that Justine has been accused of the murder. A servant had found a picture of Caroline Frankenstein in Justine's pocket. This picture was last seen with William. Victor tells everyone that Justine is innocent but doesn't tell everyone why he knows that Justine is innocent because he doesn't want to be called a crazy person. Always two steps back with this one. Elizabeth cries in Victor's arms because she's losing a friend and Victor comforts her saying that he's sure she'll be acquitted. But the trial comes again and Victor does absolutely nothing. On the other hand, Elizabeth is called as a character witness for her friend. That doesn't help, though, because Justine confesses to the crime because she doesn't want to go to hell, even if she is innocent, and eventually is executed. In the 1818 version, Elizabeth has a moving speech about the unfairness of the justice system. Wow, some things never change. try to comfort you, but this, I fear, is an evil too deep and poignant to admit of consolation, for there is no hope. Yet heaven bless thee, my dearest Justine, with resignation and a confidence elevated beyond this world. Oh, how I hate its shows and mockeries. When one creature is murdered, another is immediately deprived of life in a slow, torturing manner. And the executioners, 
their hands yet reeking with the blood of innocence, believe that they have done a great deed. They call this retribution. Hateful name. When that word is pronounced, I know greater and more horrid punishments are going to be inflicted than the gloomiest tyrant has ever invented to satiate his utmost revenge. Yet this is not consolation for you, my Justine, unless indeed that you may glory in escaping from so miserable a den. Alas, I would I were in peace with my aunt and my lovely William, escaped from a world which is hateful to me and the visages of men which I abhor. This speech is cut from the 1831 edition, showing that maybe Shelley was less of a radical compared to when she was a teenager. Anyway, back to the story. Victor is off sulking again because his monster has killed two innocent people now. Of course, his guilt means nothing because he still does nothing. Oh, and he thinks of suicide, but what would that solve? His father decides to take the family to their vacation house to cheer them up. That night, he sleeps like a baby. One day, Victor is feeling down again, so he goes on another hike. He reaches the top of the mountain and looks in awe at the majesty of the icy landscape. But he also notices a figure moving fast towards him from a distance. He feels faint, but when finally confronted with the ugliness of his creation, he's angry. Go away or else, he shouts. Really, Victor, how exactly are you gonna get rid of an eight-foot hulk of man flesh? It's like Timothée Chalamet challenging The Rock to a wrestle. I'm sorry, I have to say his name like that. It's just Timothée Chalamet. Anyway, okay, back to what I was saying. The monster's like, hey, deadbeat dad, you should at least try to listen to my story. And Frankenstein says, uh, sure, a uh, creature I refuse to take responsibility for. And the monster brings him to a cave of ice and builds a fire. And then we get the monster's point of view. The creature wakes up all confused, much like someone who's just been born. I assume because who really remembers the moment they're born? Anyway, he begins to experience things like light and dark, heat and cold, hunger and thirst and he walks around and finds himself in a forest. He settles there for the next few days learning with his senses. Sight, sound, scent, to distinguish the difference between the plants and animals around him. He also feels pain and cries. One night, he stumbles across a fire left by beggars and is happy to be warm. He tries to touch it, but it burns him, and this is how he discovers that fire is both good and bad. Then he manages to teach himself how to build it. But food is scarce, so he wanders around until he finds a hut. There's an old man inside, and he shrieks and runs away as soon as he sees the creature. The creature moves on to the village where more people shout and run away from him in fear. Or worse, they throw stones at him. From this, he learns to stay away from people. He eventually finds a small abandoned shack near a cottage. In the morning, he discovers a crack in the wall where he can see his neighbors. A young man, a young woman, and an old man. Through the winter, he watches the family and steals their food. But then he realizes that they're always unhappy, and maybe it's because he's stealing their food. So he stops doing that, and to make up for it, he helps clear the snow from their walkways and leaves firewood at their door. He also observes that they communicate with sound, so he ends up teaching himself language by listening to them talk. One day, he sees his reflection in a pool of water and is taken aback. Now he knows why people keep screaming at the sight of him. He compares himself to the young couple who are beautiful and graceful. And he becomes a little bit obsessed with the family and dreams of winning their love by being gentle and helpful. One day, a foreign woman comes to stay at the cottage. She's beautiful but doesn't speak the language, so the family teaches her. The creature listens in on the lessons, so he also improves. The young man, Felix, also teaches the woman some world history, sociology, gender studies, etc. So the creature learns that too. He's amazed with all the new knowledge, but soon becomes depressed because of how different he looks. He knows he can never walk freely in their world. Through the monsters eavesdropping, we get some backstory on the family, but uh, 
I'm not sure if this is something you'd really care about. The gist is they were once rich but lost everything through some injustice. This gives the monster hope that the family will understand and accept him. One night, the creature is in the woods looking for food when he stumbles on a bag and some books and clothes. One of the books is Paradise Lost by John Milton. One of the inspirations for this novel and, in fact, is quoted in the epigraph of the 1818 edition. The book has a big effect on the creature and he thinks it's factual and not fiction because no one's there to tell him the difference. He thinks it's hashtag relatable, especially the character of Satan. Yet no one's there to explain that to him either. Now that he knows how to read, he finds a journal in one of the pockets of his clothes. They're Victor's clothes, actually, and it's Victor's journal. He discovers the method of his creation and how much Victor is grossed out by him. He decides that he has one last chance to get himself some friends. The old man in the cottage is blind, so he plans to approach him while the others are away. When he gets the courage to enact his plan, the old man is kind to him. And the creature is like, Yay, I can finally talk to someone! He tries to explain his circumstances to the old man, but when he's in the middle of it, the others return. And yeah, it does not go well. They all freak out and Felix beats him with a stick. The monster does not retaliate though, even though he is stronger. He just runs back into his hovel. Cursed! Cursed creator! Why did I live? Why, in that instant, did I not extinguish the spark of existence which you had so wantonly bestowed? I know not. Despair had not yet taken possession of me. My feelings were those of rage and revenge. I could with pleasure have destroyed the cottage and its inhabitants, and glutted myself with their shrieks and misery. When night came, I quitted my retreat and wandered in the wood, and now, no longer restrained by the fear of discovery, I gave vent to my anguish in fearful howlings. I was like a wild beast that had broken the toils, destroying the objects that obstructed me, and ranging through the wood with a stag-like swiftness. Oh, what a miserable night I passed! The cold stars shone in mockery, and the bare trees waved their branches above me. Now and then the sweet voice of a bird burst forth amidst the universal stillness. All save I were at rest or in enjoyment. I, like the archfiend, bore a hell within me, and finding myself unsympathized with, wished to tear up the trees, spread havoc and destruction around me, and then to have sat down and enjoyed the ruin. The family decides that they can no longer stay in the cottage with a monster running loose nearby. In anger, the monster swears revenge on the entire human race. He sets fire to the empty cottage and watches it burn to the ground. Then he travels to Geneva to deal with a jerk who started it all, Victor. Along the way, he rescues a young girl from drowning, but of course, this was met with more screaming and this time, a bullet. Wounded and in pain, the monster gets angrier at the world. Eventually, he reaches Geneva. He runs into a beautiful child and immediately tries to befriend him. The child, however, screams at the monster and calls him a lot of ugly names. He also lets it slip that his father is Frankenstein and yes, this is William, Victor's brother. What crazy random happenstance, he thinks. My revenge can start now. So he strangles the boy to death. Then he notices the picture William is carrying and snatches it. Then he wanders around and comes across a girl sleeping in a barn. He leaves the picture in her pocket and yes, the girl is Justine. We return to the present and the creature goes, So, daddy-o, I'm lonely and you owe me for making me like this in the first place. I mean, it's not like I asked to be born or anything. Can I, um, can I have a girlfriend? We go back to Victor's point of view, and at first he refuses the request, and the monster replies with this reasoning. A. You decided to play God. B. Then you made me, Adam. So C. Now it's time to make Eve. 
And he continues, And well, if I can't have love, then I'll have fear. It's not like he really wants to be a murderer. And if Victor agrees, then the monster will promise to disappear with his bride somewhere in South America where no man will ever see them again or something like that. So Victor's like, Okay, fine. I'll make you a girlfriend. And the monster's like, Yay, no more loneliness. He warns Victor that he'll be watching his progress. And Victor is so scared that he starts on the project right away. Yeah, who am I kidding? That's not true at all. Victor procrastinates because he is the absolute worst. He decides that he has to go all the way to England to make it work. His father asks, why can't you just stay and marry Elizabeth? And Victor's like, yeah, yeah, the marriage is totally on. I just have to do this one little thing first. Little, sure. His father agrees to let him go to England for two years. And Victor takes Henry along with him. And Henry is like literal sunshine throughout the journey while Victor remains his broody, broody self. In England, Victor can't work with Henry hanging around, so he convinces him to take a tour in Scotland while Victor goes up further north to do his work. Finally, alone in his new laboratory, Victor starts frantically making a new creature. <laughs> I'm kidding. He does start making one, but it takes longer because he procrastinates every now and again. Mostly out of guilt because now he knows the consequences of his actions. It also occurs to him that maybe the future Mrs. Monster might hate her groom at first sight or she won't agree with the life that her hubby had planned for them, so she goes off and kills everybody. Or what if they do like each other and make a lot of monster babies together and then decide to kill everybody? Eesh. Victor looks up and it's like he can see the monster looking at him. In a sort of hissy fit, he destroys all the progress he's made so far. Later, the monster approaches him. Hey, daddy-o, father, birth giver, dude, what about your promise? Victor tells him he'll never make another creature ever again. The monster repeats his threat of revenge. He vows to be there on Victor's wedding night and then leaves. Victor's so conceited that he thinks it means the monster's gonna kill him on his wedding night. Dude, as the saying goes, it's an eye for an eye. That means a bride for a bride. But of course, Victor's too busy sleeping to realize this. Then he gets a letter from Henry that's basically like, can we go now? So Victor gathers up all the chemicals and evidence and rows out into the ocean in the middle of the night to dump them all in the water. Then he goes to sleep again. Okay, first of all, that is not good for the environment, dude. When he wakes up, he's not anywhere near shore. He panics for a bit, but the wind changes and he lands in a nearby town. The townspeople treat him rudely and he asks them why and they say it's because he's a murderer. Well, he did just dump some body parts into the ocean, but it turns out the victim is a gentleman, so they're not talking about cut up lady parts. They take him away to the magistrate or the local judge. The witnesses say they tripped on a body on the beach, and first they think he drowned, but when they examined him, they saw the marks of fingers on his neck. Another witness claims he saw a boat with a man from the shore, and that the boat was the same boat that Victor landed in. The magistrate takes Victor to the body to see his reaction when he looks at it. The corpse is a beautiful young man in his mid-twenties and... Yeah, you guessed it, it's his BFF Henry! Yikes. So, Victor reacts all right. In grief, he throws himself over the body and has to be dragged out of the room, then shortly falls ill with a fever that lasts for two months. Victor wakes up in prison. While asleep, he kept raving about killing William, Justine, and Henry, so people still think he's a murderer. But the magistrate seems to be treating him kindly. He tells him he has a visitor, and it turns out to be Victor's father. Victor's father stays with him and supports him throughout the trial. The evidence against him is circumstantial, so Victor is found innocent of the murder. Which is a very different result compared to Justine's trial a few chapters ago. Hmm, is that injustice I smell? Anyway, Victor and his father return to Geneva. They pass by Paris so Victor can recover a bit. He receives a letter from Elizabeth asking if he loves another. She's in love with him and would rather not marry him if it's against his free will. The proper answer from Victor would have been, Yes, I am totally in love with myself. P.S. I created a monster and he wants to kill everyone I love, so let's postpone the marriage until I deal with it properly. But of course, that's not what he says. He says, Sure, I want to marry you, sis. I just got a terrible secret, but I'll tell you after the wedding. Yeah, that's gonna end well. 
So Victor continues to brood and worry about how the monster is out to kill him on his wedding night, all while planning it. You know, for a boy with supposedly every intelligence, he ain't got no common sense at all. Back to the story. So they get married and ride off into the sunset to live happily ever after. <laughs> Please tell me you didn't believe that because that is not what happened. That night, Elizabeth asks him why he's so nervous, and Victor just shrugs her off. He decides that it's a great idea to send Elizabeth alone to her room while he searches around the house for a monster. Not very long after, he hears Elizabeth scream. When he reaches the room, it is too late. She's dead. People from the inn gather in the room. Victor thinks he sees the monster out the window and fires his pistol at him. He finally gets it into his head that because the monster is alone and miserable, he wants Victor to be alone and miserable too. Victor returns to his father's house in Geneva. He tells him about Elizabeth's gruesome murder and his father dies from the shock and grief. And just like that, the monster's revenge is complete. Victor goes to the magistrate to confess everything, but like he feared a while ago, the magistrate just thinks he's crazy. So, Victor decides it's time for his revenge on the monster. Victor follows the monster around, but the monster is just way too smart for him, always leaving crumbs but never allowing Victor to get close enough for a confrontation. He chases him all the way up north to here and now on the ship with Captain Walton. Remember him? Victor knows that he's dying, so he asks Walton to kill the monster if he ever sees him. Returning to the framing device, that is, Walton writing letters to his sister, Walton believes Victor's story and regrets that he didn't meet him in better circumstances. Because if they did, they'd be the best of friends. Um, you might want to rethink that as all of Victor's BFFs have ended up six feet under. Also, Victor comes across as a selfish idiot on most days, so you really want to associate with that kind of mess? Meanwhile, Walton's crew are begging him, we have to go back to England. They're sick and tired of being stuck on the ice, a common occurrence on every expedition to the north. Victor inserts himself into a conversation and gives a motivational speech like, How dare you give up on the dream of glory! You must be brave, be men, be heroes, and boldly go where no man has ever gone before. Really? Victor, really? As someone who boldly went there and then regretted every step afterwards, you sure have not learned your lesson yet. So the speech temporarily motivates the crew, but two days later, they're asking Walton to turn back and he agrees. Maybe because he's scared of a mutiny. A few days later, when the ice melts enough for them to move, Victor dies. Another few days later and Walton hears a strange noise coming from Victor's room. It's the monster and he's crying over Victor's body. The monster is as horrible as Victor described, but not quite as murdery. In fact, now that Victor's dead, the monster has no reason to live. He tells Walton that he regrets his actions and he's going to continue onwards to the North Pole, build a bonfire, and barbecue himself on it. And with that dramatic proclamation, he throws himself out of the cabin window and disappears into the darkness. He is dead who called me into being. And when I shall be no more, the very remembrance of us both will speedily vanish. I shall no longer see the sun or stars, or feel the winds play on my cheeks. Light, feeling, and sense will pass away. And in this condition must I find my happiness. Some years ago, when the images which this world affords first opened upon me, when I felt the cheering warmth of summer, and heard the rustling of the leaves and the warbling of the birds, and these were all to me, I should have wept to die. Now it is my only consolation. Polluted by crimes, and torn by the bitterest remorse, where can I find rest but in death? Farewell, I leave you, and in you the last of humankind whom these eyes will ever behold. Farewell, Frankenstein. It's hard to talk about Frankenstein without talking about the woman behind it. 
Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley was born to influential parents. Her father, William Godwin, was a writer slash philosopher. Her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, wrote one of the most important works of the early feminist movement, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, published in 1792. Unfortunately, Wollstonecraft died of an infection 11 days after her daughter's birth. Mary would be haunted by her mother's legacy all her life. In fact, her mother's grave becomes a sort of hangout for her. It's there where she learns how to read by tracing the letters on her mother's gravestone. Well, looks like that's one thing her mother's teaching her from the grave. Also, it is allegedly where she loses her virginity. And that's not what her mother taught her, but that is one way to get her mother rolling in her grave. Her lover was poet and noted radical Percy Bysshe Shelley. And if you're thinking, Bish what? I'm telling ya, Bish yes. Percy Bysshe Shelley, who was also slightly married at the time. Percy eloped with his then wife when he was 19 and she was 16. Obviously, that wasn't meant to last. At 21, he runs away with a 16-year-old Mary, bringing along her stepsister Claire. The Thruple would go on a tour of Europe where some of the locations served as inspiration for Frankenstein. Of course, the scandal caused them to be shunned by English society, including Mary's father and Percy's rich grandpa who controlled his money. Two years later, Percy's wife dies and the lovers marry to try to fix the situation. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. And by 29, Percy is dead in a sailing accident. So when you try to choose between which Frankenstein editions to read, you should pick up on the fact that they were released by two different Marys. The younger was suffering through the deaths of a child, a sister, and her mother, plus the abandonment of her father and a tumultuous love affair with a brilliant but somewhat self-involved boy. No, really, I'm leaving out a lot of details because we just don't have the time for that. So all these feelings channeled into the text makes the character of the creature so compelling. But the wait of 30 years is seen in the 1831 version. The plot doesn't change much, but the characterization and motivations do. You can decide how much this affects the actual story. While in the 1818 version, Victor mostly chooses to be selfish. In the updated one, fate plays a more powerful role in his life just like it had done in Mary's. Because by then, older Mary had lost not only her mother, child, and sister, but also a husband, four more children, one of that to a miscarriage, and even two of her friends in the room on that day of the ghostwriting contest. If that isn't enough to change a person's perspective, then, quite frankly, I don't know what is. And there we have it! I hope I was able to make Frankenstein a little bit easier for you to digest. Anyway, I'm Gabby, and you can find me at Gabby Pasquavox on Instagram or Twitter. Or you can use the hashtag DigestiblesPodcast. Please do tell me what you thought of this episode. Special thanks to Thor and to Merrick for providing the narrations and to Jazz for composing our theme music. I hope you guys have a great weekend ahead and happy Halloween, may I say. Time to celebrate the ghouls and the ghosts all around. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye! Digestibles is part of Connect, a podcast network, bringing together entertaining stories to spark your imagination. For more awesome content, visit connectpodcast.net or follow us on social media at Connect Podcasts.